once again, we looked over in this particular passage a couple weeks ago. As you, as you turn there tonight, I want to ask you this question. We want to preach on it. And uh, some of you married couples tonight, it might put a, a smile on your face. But I want to ask you this tonight. How's your love life? Well, it's kind of quiet. Uh, that, that must mean it might may not be too good. I don't know. Uh, but I, I want you to think of how, how is your love life. But I want to look here tonight in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, uh, and, and look with us uh, this evening uh, here in verse number uh, 28. The Bible said, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribes said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all thy heart, and with all thy understanding, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw they answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any question. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. I thank you, Lord, this evening for the privilege you give us to gather together one more time on this side of eternity. God, to sing the songs of Zion, Lord, and to worship you. And I'm glad, Lord, we can worship you in spirit and in truth. What a wonderful God we serve this evening. And I'm glad as they sung that song, there's nothing, God, that you can't do. Lord, things may look difficult in this life, but we thank you for what a wonderful Savior we serve. I ask you, Lord, that you might illuminate our mind. May you fill us full of the Spirit of God, and may you give us liberty, give us power tonight. And we pray, Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that we'd be able to walk away from this place saying that it's been good to be in the house of God. We love you now. Thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, as we look here tonight in Mark chapter number 12, I believe basically... Uh, that Jesus was, he didn't ask the question, but I believe that implication was there as he began to reply to the scribe here that asked the question in verse number 28, and that is, how is your love life? You know, a few weeks ago we looked at this beginning back in verse number 18, and we read through the, re the rest of the chapter and we talked about the different religious groups that were implied here. We looked at the Pharisees. And, and you know, in many different chapters in, in the Gospels, we find where uh, the Lord Jesus, uh, uh, how he dealt with different religious groups, one of them being the Pharisees. And, and the Pharisees, as we know it, they were legal traditionalists. Uh, they actually uh, uh, were individuals that uh, wore a religious mass, so to speak, and but yet their hearts were provided, they were uh, uh, perverted. Uh, we know tonight, uh, in, in the day and age which we live in, that there are a lot of Pharisees uh, tonight where they try to make clean the outside of the cup, but they don't deal with which, what is on the inside. And, and then we looked at the scribes. In fact, if you'll notice there in verse number 28, we find that they that, that, that said one of the scribes came, having heard them reasoning together and, and perceiving that he answered them well, ask him, uh, which is the first uh, uh, commandment of all? In other words, uh, what the scribe meant here was, 
which is the first commandment of importance. And so we know that the scribes, as we know them, they were what was called in, in the days when Christ walked upon the earth, they were legal experts. And, and, and basically they were very similar to the Pharisees of the fact that they cleaned the outside of the platter, but the scum of sin was still on the inside and needed to be dealt with. And then we know tonight there was a, what is called as the Sadducees. And the Sadducees were, had the influence of the Hellenistic view, and uh, they, were very cons they, they were very conservative in their view of Judaism. But one of the problems with the Sadducees was this, is that the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So listen, folks, I'm glad that Christ died. I'm glad that he shed his blood for me. Uh, but why is that? Because the Bible said in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sin. There's no way that we can be forgiven tonight if Christ would not have laid down his life. Uh, and, and by the way, he, uh, you know, in, in addition to laying down his life, no man took his life from him, but the blood had to be shed. And in order for us to be a saved tonight, not only the blood had to be shed, but the blood has to be applied to our hearts as human beings. But yet, but yet here's the thing tonight. It's one thing for him to shed his blood, but he went to a barred tomb on the third day. He came up out of the grave. And so we know tonight that Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And, and so, you know, it's one thing for him to have shed his blood, but it's another thing for him to rise from the grave on the third day. And we, as we know about our Savior, he's the first fruit of the resurrection. But the Sadducees did not believe this tonight. In fact, the Bible said in Acts 23, 8, it said, For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees uh, confess both. Now, uh, in the context of the matter, uh, the Pharisees and the scribe, the, they, they actually were dealing here in, in Mark chapter number 12. Now, as we think about this night, you know, you go back and look at the Old Testament, and we find what was called the Jewish books of the law. And the Jewish books of the law were what are, are they're the first five books of the Old Testament, what we know as the Pentateuch. Uh, 613 laws were given to men. 248 of those laws were actually considered positive, while 365 of those laws were considered, uh, had a negative implication. Uh, and, and they form the, the basis for all Jewish belief. One preacher said this. He said because of the way that they were interpreted, uh, the law that is, these experts in Mosaic law uh, laid heavy burdens uh, on the people, yet with elaborate evasions uh, and high hyperboles. In this context of Mark chapter number 12, Jesus takes all the 613 rules and regulations and he sums up, think about it, think with me now, 613 laws back uh, in the Old Testament and what he does here in Mark chapter number 12, he sums them up into two great statements of divine truth. And uh, Jesus, in essence, uh, he boils all the law, all the commandments, and all the teachings of the prophets into one word. And what is that word? It's love. That is what the Lord deals with here in Mark chapter number 12. Now, how important is that? We find tonight that as we study our Bible, that that word love is mentioned multitudes of time in, our, in the Word of God. I think about, you know, in fact, I want to ask you this tonight. If I was to ask you what's the love chapter, what would you say? What was that? First Corinthians chapter number 13. That's exactly right. And we find uh, tonight in verse number uh, uh, 3, it said, And now uh, about of faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Thank God for faith. Hey, the just shall live by how, folk? We live by faith. And what a blessing it is tonight to walk by faith. And one day, my friend, we'll be able to see the, the, the Lord that we've served all these many years by faith. Thank God for faith. 
And then we find, you know, he, he, uh, Paul, as he wrote the church at Corinth, not only talked about faith, but he talked about hope. I don't know about you, but I'm glad, thank God, there's hope tonight. It don't matter who we talk to. It don't matter who we come across this week. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't matter how deep this sin their life might be. I'm glad we can offer them hope. That, that hope is not in us as individuals. The hope is not in our church, but the hope is ba based upon the Lord Jesus Christ. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. Thank God for faith. Thank God for hope. But thank God for love tonight. The greatest of these tonight is charity, or, or, or it's love. And, and, you know, as we think about the Word of God tonight, this is the greatest love story, my friend, that's ever been written. How that God looked beyond our faults. He saw our need. How that God saw that we were a bunch of sinners, a bunch of scumbags, a bunch of murderers, a bunch of thieves, a, a bunch of adulterers, a bunch of liars, a, a bunch of rotten core people. And what did he do? He sent his only son, the Lord Jesus, my friend, to die for us on the cross of Calvary. Why? Because he loved us. What a blessed day is tonight, folk. Uh, you know, there, there's multitudes uh, of, of songs in our hymn book, multitudes of songs in our choir book that talk about the love of God. And, and, and you know, tonight, I'll be honest with you, as I look back over my life, 40 years ago when I got saved, I did not get saved because I, I was afraid that I was going to die and go to hell. Even though, I'll be honest with you, probably just like you, I did not want to die and go to hell. Amen? But the thing that overwhelmed me as I looked back on that night in that revival meeting, the thing that got to me and still does, by the way, I could not believe that the God of heaven would love an old sinner like me. And sometimes, as I go through the week, it'll just hit me. It may hit me here in the church. It may hit me right down the road. I may be in the hospital. I may be talking to somebody on the street, and it just overwhelms me. The love of God. I think about that old song that says, Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? And may I say tonight, it is absolutely, positively wonderful tonight to be loved by the God of heaven tonight, folk. And so we find these 613 commandments that were given back in the Old Testament. You know, this scribe comes and he he heard the religious leaders uh, talking to our Lord and Savior. He asked the question, which is the first commandment of all? And what he meant by that was this, which is the most important? And Jesus responded, the first of all the commandments. And he quotes Deuteronomy chapter number 6, verses 3 through 5. And he said the first of the commandments is here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. In other words, this is the first in importance. One preacher put it like this, I know not how otherwise to put my thoughts into words so that they may hint at my burning meaning. May the Lord of love look into your very eyes with those eyes which were once rotted with weeping over human sin. May he touch your hands with those hands that were nailed to the cross and impress the, uh, the, the blessed nail marks upon your feet. And, that, and may he pierce your heart till it put forth a life for love and flow out in... in, in, in uh, 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 ideas of kind desires and generous deeds and holy sacrifices for God for his people. Oh, grant it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, as we look here tonight in Mark chapter number 12, I want to give you three or four things tonight to think about. First of all, notice if you would the characteristics of the great commandments. The characteristics. Uh, what were they made of? Well, we see tonight in verse number 28, we see what is called the supreme commandment. In other words, it was first in importance. You know, you think about the Ten Commandments. I always thought as, uh, as a child, uh, you know, when Moses went up to Mount Sinai and, and, and God gave him the, the Ten Commandments and, and he came down, and I, I always thought, which one's the most important? Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, 
Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And the list go, goes on and on. But yet as we think about all these laws, in fact, there's more than 10 commandments. There's 613 laws. And, 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 and as we mentioned a while ago, most of them deal with the negative more than the positive. But what is the first in importance? Well, we find that quote that Jesus quoted here in Mark chapter number 12 in verse number 29 in Deuteronomy chapter number 6 verse 5 where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. In other words, what he's saying there is that God must occupy first place in our lives. So my question tonight is this, how's your love life? Who's first tonight in your life? And if you'll notice this evening in this verse of Scripture, that it, that it begins to break it down there in verse number 30. What does it mean when he says, in all your heart? It has the idea of the seat of our emotions. Uh, many times uh, it's been referred to that Jesus was saying, we love without pretense. In other words, the idea tonight when we think about with all our heart, genuinely, uh, do, do, we, do we genuinely love him? I mean, do we love him, folk? You know, the Bible said in 1 John, said we love him. Why? Because he what? Because he first loved us. Well, it says here, uh, what's referred to is that God must occupy first place, first and foremost. He's all our heart. And then he says, with all our soul, the idea of our, our emotions. We are, we are not to love God with some kind of, uh, of uh, dreary, uh, antiseptic love, but emotional in our love for him. Our love for him should touch us at a most intimate level. All our heart, all our soul. And then what does he say there? With all our mind. It's an involvement of our intellect. This love is not mindless or empty-headed. But we love the Lord because we have uh, manifested upon Him and made conscious decision. We, listen, we made a conscious decision to love Him. I have a choice tonight. I don't have to love Him. I wasn't made to love him. My wife doesn't tell me I've got to love the Lord. Listen, I, I made a choice. I want to love the Lord. Why? Because he first loved me. He did something for me that nobody else could do. And, and, what, and what a listen, folks, what a blessing it is not to have a, have a relationship with the one that made it all. What, what, a, what, a, what, a blessed, what, what a blessed privilege it is tonight to be able to fellowship with a God of heaven. And, and so... We, we make a conscious decision to love him. Why do we come to church? We, we, listen, we should not come to church because we're afraid somebody's going to call us if we don't. We, we shouldn't come to church tonight uh, because uh, we're afraid about what somebody's going to say about us, but we should consciously make a decision to come. Why? Because we love him. Why, why do we pick up this Bible tonight? And, and by the way, my friend, we, we come to church. We're here Sunday, here, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and uh, some may come to RU. But the bottom line is this. It's not so much what we do in here. It's what we do on the outside. And I want to tell you how much we love God. It's going to show up by, by based on what we do when we leave this place. I, listen, you ever thought about this? A lot of time we we talk about tithing. And we always turn over to Malachi chapter number 3, verses 1 through 7. We talk about the tithe, the tenth, being holy unto the Lord. And a lot of time we talk about our dimes and our nickels and our dollars and our pennies and the money that we give. Hey, have you ever thought about, my friend, tithing of your heart and your time? Do you realize that 16-point hours a week we spend in prayer? 16.8 hours that we spend in the Word of God. 16 point hours, my friend, that we grab the God of heaven's hand and we walk through the meadows you and we have that sweet, intimate fellowship with him. I want to tell you, my friend, if we're not, listen, what is that? That's like a conscience decision to love him. And I believe that that is what Jesus Christ was, the implication was to describe when he gave the answer. When he said, 
What is the commandment that is the most important? Jesus. And Jesus answered, the, the first of all the commandments is here, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. And, and so in order to fulfill that, you must love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And then he gives something else. And with all thy strength. Not be a thing that is done in word alone, but our bodies are his as well. No right to desire, no, there's no right to divide the spiritual from the physical. Uh, and we do that with all our strength in sincerity and fervency. But I want you to notice this night, he shifts gears. And he says, and the second is like, namely this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. I want to ask you a dumb question you don't have to answer. You ever had a neighbor that's hard to get along with? Ever, you ever had somebody that I mean just got on your nerves so bad you couldn't stand it? You ever had somebody that as you sit there tonight, you think in your mind, how in the world could I love that individual as myself? Well, I don't know about you tonight. Listen. Those 613 commandments that Christ gave back in the Old Testament, he narrows it down from 613 to 2. And those, six th those 613 hang on these two. The, the, these two are the revolving doors, so to speak. And, and so he, the, the first is that we love the Lord God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. But then he moves and he shifts gear. And he said, and the second is like, namely this, that you love your neighbor as the self. There's no other, great, great, no other commandment greater than these. The second Derek commandment, we, we find you go back to Leviticus chapter number 19 and verse number 18. It said, Thou shalt not avenge, nor be, bear it, listen now, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. I've been pastoring for a, a long time, and I want to tell you, I've seen a whole lot of people walk around with grudges. Have you? It said, but, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Why? I am the Lord God. That's what he said. Now, what did he mean by this? That thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, I'm glad you asked me. Because I believe that I got something I think that might help you a little bit. I believe that we can, we, we've got to do that uh, positionally, positionally. How, how, do, how do we love our neighbor as ourselves? Well, we, we do it positionally. What I mean by that, we look out for their best, in, their best uh, interest, their welfare, and their good. You know, the Bible said in Philippians chapter number 2 and verse 3, it said, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem, uh, let each esteem other better than themselves. Romans 12 and verse 10 said, be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. In other words, what does that mean, Open Door Baptist Church? In other words, we love others with the same type of compassion that we have toward ourselves. You know, one of the things that I've learned down through the years, people can see through the talk. We, we can say, I love you, but when it gets down to it, it's in shoe leather. And, and I'll be honest with you, 
as a pastor, as a Christian, I, that, that is one of my objectives. That is one of my long-term goals that I try to achieve, my friend, is not just say it with my tongue, but put it into shoe leather so when my friend people know it. They may not be able to understand it, but I want to tell you, when they get in their bedroom at night and they're in that room by themselves, they know, my friend, hey, that man loves me. See this secondary commitment, a commandment loving our neighbors ourselves. How do we do this? Positionally. But then I, I believe the only way that we can do it is prayerfully. But you know the Bible says, uh, uh, you know, one of the ways that we love our neighbor with, as ourselves is we we've got to actually pray for people, folks. We got to pray. And you know what? Listen. You know what the Bible says. And I, I'll be honest with you. I don't know that I've ever been in a, church, a, a service at Open Door like this. But a lot of times, my friend, when we somebody's sick, they'll say, Preacher, will you anoint my loved one with oil? You've seen us do it. In fact, when we went down to the hospital the other day with Karen and her uh, sister and her uh, niece, I took a bottle of oil. We went in there and I prayed over them. And, and then she lay in the bed and we prayed together. But I think about what the Bible said here in James chapter 5 and verse 16. It says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. Why? That you may be healed. And then he went on to say that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man of Elohim. Can I ask y'all dumb questions? How long has it been since you've been in a service where you had somebody sitting up, sitting up here on this uh, maybe this pew or that pew or that one back there? They stood up before the whole church and said, I just want you to know, brother so-and-so, I've lied about you, I've treated you unkind, and I want you to forgive me, and I want the whole church to forgive me. Then all of a sudden, my friend, there'd be somebody over here on this side, they'd stand up and begin to weep and cry and say, hey, I just want you to know, sister so-and-so, I've been a scum dog. I've lied, I've cheated, I've done this and that, and I want you to forgive me. And before you know it, there's five or ten people, they're meeting in the middle, hugging and slinging, snorting and weeping, and I mean you have a hallelujah time because people are loving each other and getting right with each other. It's been a long time since I've been in service like that. How about you? But, folk, I want to tell you, didn't it say there in James 5, confess your faults one to another? Uh, and pray one for another, why? That you may be healed. And I believe the implication is, my friend, listen, there may be physical healing that needs to take place, but I believe a lot of times, my friend, there's mental healing and there's spiritual healing that needs to transpire in people's lives. And he went on to say that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So we see tonight that this secondary commandment, listen, we, 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 we see the idea positionally, we see the idea prayerfully, and then we see the, the idea powerfully. And what I mean by that is, one of the ways that we can reach that goal tonight is by being an extra miler. An extra miler. You know what the Bible said in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 11? It said, And whosoever shall compel them thee to go a mile, go with him twain. In other words, make up our mind. We say, well, you, you know, a lot of times we think in our mind, well, well, they wouldn't do this, or they wouldn't do that. Well, we don't have to be like, we can go the extra mile. They, they may not apologize. They may not love me. They may not pray for me. Well, by the grace of God, I don't have to do that way. I'm going to go the extra mile. Amen, folk? And I believe tonight, if we're going to fulfill this commandment that Jesus set out for us in Mark chapter number 12, where we love thy neighbor as thyself. And if you'll notice tonight, he said there's none other commandment greater than these in this whole book. No greater. Not any more important than these. You know, Spurgeon said this. He said he loved you when there was nothing good in you. He loved you before you insulted him. He loved you when there was nothing good in you. He loved you though you insulted him, though you despised him, and rebelled against him. He has loved you right on and never ceased to love you. He has loved you in your backslidings. 
and loved you out of those backlightings. He has loved you in your sinfulness, in your wickedness, and in your folly. His loving heart was still eternally the same. And he shed his heart's blood to prove his love for you. He has given you what you would want on earth and provided for you a habitation in a place called heaven. Now, Christian, your, religious claim, your, your religion claims for you that you should love your master as he loved you. How can you imitate him unless you love too? Will you, will you leave to the uh, Macroditers and to the Jews and to the infidels called hardness, unkindness, though they were more in keeping with their views. But with you, unkindness is a strange anomaly. It is a gross contradiction to the, to the spirit of your religion. And if you love not your neighbor, I see not how you can be a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a powerful statement, folk. What would he say there if we truly don't love our neighbor, if we don't fulfill that commandment that Jesus laid for, uh, for us, that is one of the indicators tonight, my friend, how people know whether or not we're truly saved or not. Uh, listen, I've met people before that said they were saved, but, but I, I want to tell you there was a spirit of bitterness and hatefulness about them. Every time you got around them, it was, I mean, just a, a spirit of hatefulness. Listen, if anything ought to be bubbling out of our eyeballs and our mouth and our actions, it ought to be the spirit of love in our soul tonight. We love him. Why? Because he first loved us. And because he first loved us, what should we be doing? We ought to love our neighbors ourselves. Uh, Y'all still with me tonight? Listen we, 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 listen, we see tonight the supreme commandment. We see uh, tonight uh, the specifics of this commandment. Jesus used the word loved. Uh, and it's used, uh, the word love in the Bible is used for, in four different words. Actually, I, I just want to mention three of them. The word eros, which means sexual love. The word phileo, which means a tender affection for someone. And the word agape. And that word agape means a never-ending and unchanging love for someone. In other words, that agape love is a forever love. Can I ask you tonight, my friend, what kind of love does God have for us? It's an agape love. The Bible said in Romans chapter number 5 and verse 8, but God committed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ did what? He died for us, folks. That agape love that Jesus has for us. And, and, and I want to tell you, my friend, if, if he has that kind of love for us, then we ought to have that kind, same kind of love for others. Uh, so we see tonight the characteristics of these great commandments. But then we see, number two, we see the completeness of the great commandments. Uh, in Matthew chapter number 22, in fact, uh, take your Bible and turn back with us for a second. Matthew 22. We see, uh, we see a harmony, what I would call a harmony of the Gospels. And, and, and notice, here in verse 37 of Matthew chapter number 22, we, we see the same quote, basically, that Jesus gave there in the Gospel of Mark. What did he say? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, how? With all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor, how open door Baptist church, as thyself. And notice what he said. He, he summed it up here, and he said, on these two commandments, hang all 
the what? The law and the prophets. So we see the completeness of these great commandments. In other words, tonight, if our love life is right, we're going to treat everyone from God on down as they ought to be treated. In other words, what we're trying to say tonight is this. If we, if we do these two things, we need not worry about right or wrong or even about sinning because everything else will fall into place, I believe. I, I, listen, folks, I really believe that if we get a hold of this truth tonight here in Matthew 22, this truth in Mark 12, if we get a hold of that, that would transform our life. Why? Because basically it's the chief cornerstone. It's the foundation. It, uh, you know, uh, all the 613 laws of the, uh, the prophets that back in the Old Testament hang on these two. And I believe that there's ever a day and an hour where the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to get hold of this. I believe it's day and age which we live. So we see the characteristics of the great commandments. We see the completeness of the great commandments. And then I want to give you the third thing tonight. And I'll sum it up. Tonight it may be challenging with a couple, and that is the, the cost of the great commandments. We find where Jesus answered this scribe in verse 30. He said, And thou shalt love the Lord God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And with all thy strength, for this is the first commandment. Isn't that what your Bible says? And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Now, I know what you might be saying, preacher. You done said that about ten times tonight. Well, I'm going to say it till you get it. Because I believe tonight, we listen, if there's ever a truth that needs to be burned in our bosom, it's these two verses tonight. Now, there's a cost of these great commandments. We, we gave you the characteristics. We gave you the completeness. But then we see the cost of the great commandments. What I mean by that, if we tonight as God's people, if we fulfill verse 30 and 31, it's going to cost us something. What do we mean by that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because as a Christian, we ought to want to fulfill these, should we not? If, if we're truly saved, if we're truly who we say we are, I, I want to tell you, there ought to be a, a, a deep desire in our heart to love the Lord God with all our strength, all our soul, all our mind, all our heart. And not only that, but we want to go the next step further and we want to, want to love our neighbors, ourselves. So in order to do that, my friend, I want to tell you, it's not free. Salvation's free. But it's going to cost us something. Now, what, what, what is it going to cost us? I want to give you three things tonight and about four up underneath that. Number one, it means his will is going to be ahead of mine. He, listen, he, listen, his will is going to be more important than mine. Well, what, what, listen, what is the most important thing uh, that, uh, for, for us? And, and by the way, who knows everything about us? God does. Does he not? God's will for Brother Chuck may not be God's will for me. God's will for Brother Greg may not be God's will for me, or Matt, or, or, or Jimmy, or, or so on. God, God, listen, God has a plan for each one of us, and a will for each one of us. And I want to tell you, my friend, if we want to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength, I, listen, we ought to have a desire, my friend, to find out God's will and do it. How do we do that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Romans 12, 1 said this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your body a living sacrifice, 
holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, which means it's the very least you can do. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do we renew our mind? In God's Word. By the renewing of, our, uh, of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the cost of these great commandments, number one, is this. It's his will above mine. I've heard people say this. Well, I'm going to take my life in my hands. And do what, I, I'm, I'm going to do what I want to do. Well, I want to tell you, listen, I've had people come to Open Door Baptist Church. They say, well, I'm going to just do what I want to do. I'll say, well, you do what you want to do. You're going to feel the pain. You just, you, you, you take your life in your hands, and you be the one with the will in your hands, and you go where you want to go, and you do what you want to do. I want to take it down the road. You're going to feel the pain. But what we ought to do, like I know somebody, I can't remember the lady that wrote this song. Well, our motto is say, Jesus, you take the wheel. Take the wheel, Lord Jesus. You be the driver. You be the instructor. You show me where you want me to go and what you want me to do. That's the only way, my friend, we're going to be able to love it with all our heart and soul, mind, and strength. His will ahead of mine. And then I want to tell you not only that is his will ahead of mine, but then we yield our lives to him. And I won't get into all these verses, but, but, but two of the greatest chapters I believe in God's Word is Romans chapter number 6 and Romans chapter number 7. And it talks about yielding our lives. Our, uh, you know, don't let our members of our body be members of un as members of unrighteousness, but yield our body, yield our hands, our feet, our eyes, our, our yields, our, our ears, our, eyes, our whole body to the Lord. Why? Because this flesh wants to do things that God does not want us to do. Am I right? So the cost of the great commandments is his will is going to be a mind. Then we've got to yield our lives to him. But then here's the four or five I want to give you tonight. Think about this. If I, listen, folk, if we're going to fulfill Romans chapter number 12, and my love life's going to be right, if I'm going to love the Lord God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, and all my strength, and then if I'm going to love my neighbor as myself, there'll, there'll be some things, my friend, that we will not want to do at times. You might say, what do you mean by that? There may be some times I may have to eat crow. Hello? Not only that, there may be, have, there, listen, there may be some time I may have to seek forgiveness. Can I ask you this question? Since you've been saved, I wonder how many times you've gone to somebody and wrapped your arms around them and looked in the, in the eyeball with tears running down your face and say, I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? Because I'll be honest with you, if we'd all be fruitful tonight, there's probably been a time or two or many more than that where we as individuals have been wrong. And we need to make it right. Uh, I may have to eat crow. I may have to seek forgiveness. I, listen, I may have to sacrifice. If I'm going to love my neighbors myself and love the Lord God with all my heart, all soul, mind, and strength, I may have to sacrifice. I may have to give up some time. 168 hours a week, I may have to do so. I may have to take some of those precious moments that I have and do it and exercise it for the glory of God. Not only that, but I may have to reach out to some people that may be difficult in reaching out to. But I'll tell you this night, if, I, if I'm going to fulfill this commandment tonight, loving my neighbor as myself, I may have to do something that's really hard and folky. This may not be, I, I may have to pray. And I know what some of you are thinking tonight, because I can tell by the way you're looking at me, you say, well, praying sure is easy. I'm glad it's easy for you, but it's hard for me. Because I, I'd like to meet you after service. You tell me how, explain to me how it's easy. Because I found down through the last 40 years of being saved, if there's anything that the devil's going to attack, he's going to try to attack getting you out of that word and getting you off your knees. 
If the phone's going to ring or something's going to happen, he's going to do everything he can to try to get us distracted. You know, uh, as I think about this, where it says in the second is not, is like name of this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is no other commandment greater than these. It could be tonight making something right that even in our mind, in our heart, we didn't think was uh, anything wrong. I, um, I want you, if you would, tonight to take your Bible and turn with us over to the book of Matthew, chapter number 5. I want you to notice this tonight, and I, I'm going to close with this. In Matthew chapter number 5, verse 21, it said, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill, or, or shall kill, shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka, Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remembers that thy brother hath an off against thee, Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother. Then come offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly. Whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to judge and judge deliver thee to the officer and thou be cast into prison. I think about these verses tonight, I, and I, I want to just share this with, in closing. I, I think about several times in our life since I've been preaching and serving the Lord. I, I, I remember years ago when we, when we used to live down in uh, Fort Chiswell. And our our kids were, we, we we lived we lived in a, a, a little neighborhood. It was actually a it was like a cul-de-sac area a type area. And uh, and, the, and the kids uh, were very little, and they were like any other child. They'd like to get on the bicycle and ride. They'd like to scream and holler and have fun, throw the ball. And we had a neighbor across the street that didn't like that. She got mad. Came over to our house to chew my wife out about it. And I'll, I'll be honest with you tonight, as a, as a human being, I could, my, I could feel my blood pressure rising. And I'll be honest with you, that was one time I wished I wasn't saved for about 10 minutes. <laughs> and I wished I wasn't a preacher. But God taught me some things, and one of the things I did, I went down to the basement and I began to pray about it. I prayed. Lord, show me what to do. These neighbors across the street, they know that I'm a pastor. They know that we're Christians. I don't want to do anything ugly. I, I, want, to, I want to do the right thing. And... Uh, and I prayed for a couple weeks. I think I even fasted for a couple days. Then I told Crystal, I said, I'm going to go over here to their house. And I said, I went by the grocery store. I bought them a turkey. I'm going to go over here and talk to them. 
I think it was around Christmas, Thanksgiving, something like that. I went up and knocked on the door. The daughter came to the door. I said, is your mama here, your daddy here? And they came, they came to the door. I, I said, hey, y'all. I said, y'all know we live across the street. I said, I just wanted to bring you this uh, turkey and wish you a Merry Christmas. And if I can ever help you in any way, I want to be there for you. And, and uh, uh, I'm sorry for what happened. And they said, thank you. And I walked back and went home. Very next day, that lady that owned the house, the Mr. and Mrs., they, they brought candy and brownies over to our house for the kids. But it didn't stop there. I ended up leaving that church. I don't know, it was probably maybe a year after that. And found out that that lady that came over to our house in that rough situation that we had, she ended up going to the church that we started, got saved by the grace of God. I think her husband got saved as well. And then not long, not long after that, I guess probably five or ten years later, one day when the country cooking was up and up here, right up here in Christiansburg, I seen him and his wife in there. And, well, it was so good. To, it, listen, it was so good to see him. And, and, and folks, I, I want to tell you, a lot of times we may feel as though we've been treated wrong, but it, but it's never it, it's never wrong to treat people right. Be, be an extra miler. And, and there's been there's been there's been many times where in our life we've done that. But I I really believe tonight is this, and I'm gonna close. I said that about ten minutes ago. But I want to just say this. This was an important question to scribe. Remember, he was a legal expert, and he said, he knew the law, these six hundred and thirteen commandments, and he asked the Lord the question of all the laws, which one is the most important? And Jesus gave the answer. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Can I ask you this dumb question in closing tonight? How can we expect the people riding by on Route 460 out here from Christian Bird to Shaw's doing Elston? If we don't have the love of God in our heart like we should, how can we expect the sinners lost and on his way to hell to walk in these doors? Get saved by the grace. I hope and pray tonight you'll think about these things that we said. You'll say by the grace of God, Lord, help me do what I can to fulfill this. Father, as we pray.